intuition. It's more intuition that because we are only receiving from Sri Aurobindo, at least I am receiving not so very much, I have decided to use his definitions whenever possible when the word is capitalized. So it will take us a little longer, but I think we can go much deeper then. So let us begin. I have a long and naked curve of boundless self. This idea of bornless self. Uh, to a born is a limit. So bornless means without a limit. So then Sri Aurobindo capitalizes the word self. And here is where we have to go a little bit deeper into Savitri. In the essays on the Gita, Sri Aurobindo says, the self is our self-existent being. And in his letters on yoga, as well as life divine, there are many, many statements on the self. In the letters on yoga, he says, the self is being not a being. By self is meant the conscious essential existence, one in all. He says in the synthesis of yoga, in relation to the individual, the supreme is our own true and highest self. This is so powerful. That which ultimately we are in our essence, that of which we are in our manifested nature, a spiritual knowledge moved to arrive at the true self in us must reject as the traditional way of knowledge reject, rejects all misleading experiences. It must discover that the body is not our self, our foundation of existence. It is a sensible form of the infinite. I could go on and on with the word self, but I ask you to look it up because it is so important. It is the soul, the inner being, that is the true self in everyone. Letters on Yoga. The points, the next line, the points that run through the closed heart of things shadowed the indeterminable line. Indeterminable is impossible to settle or to decide anything with finality. It's not determinable. And so this point that runs through the closed heart of things shadows that indeterminable line. And what is that line that carries the everlasting through the years? Now, the everlasting is the eternal. And even in dictionaries, they will tell us that capitalized E for everlasting is God, the eternal. So now we have these points that run along this naked curve in boundless self. And note here again the capital S of self. Running through the closed heart of things, shadow this line that is impossible to decide or settle with finality. It carries the everlasting. Again, a capital E. 
designating the divine through the year. The next line is so important. The magician order of the cosmic mind. Now, cosmic, of course, means pertaining to the cosmos. But what does Sri Aurobindo say? And we find that he actually defines not only cosmic, but cosmic mind. So he says, first of all, there is no difference between the terms universal and cosmic, except that universal can be used in a freer way than cosmic. Universal may mean of the universe, cosmic in that general sense, but it may also mean common to all. This is a universal weakness. But you cannot say this is a cosmic weakness. That was in his letters on yoga. Now, he has a long description, cosmic mind in the life divine, and, and briefly synthesis and letters on yoga. And so I'm going to uh, share the one, the shorter one from the synthesis. In which he says, there is one cosmic mind, one cosmic life, one cosmic body. All the attempt of man to arrive at universal sympathy, universal love, and the understanding and knowledge of the inner soul of other existences is an attempt to beat, thin, breach, and eventually break down by the power of the enlarging mind and heart the walls of the ego and arrive nearer to a cosmic oneness. It is so beautiful. In his letters on yoga, he says, about the results of the opening of the cosmic mind. One is aware of the cosmic mind and the mental forces that move there and how they work on one's mind and that of others. And one is able to deal with one's mind with a greater knowledge and effective power. There are many other results, but this is the fundamental one. The next line in Savitri is coercing the freedom of infinity. Now, coerce is an interesting word because it means to compel. It could also mean to restrain, but here it means to compel by force or authority without regard to individual wishes or desires. We could also say to dominate or control, especially by exploiting things like fear and anxiety. So through the use of force, coercing the freedom of infinity with what? With the stark array of nature's symbol facts. This is complicated. The stark array, of course, is the bare, the blunt array. And it is harsh often or grim. Something that is stark is can austere and bare usually. Now, he also says the stark array an array is an orderly, often imposing arrangement or a series of things displayed, uh, an imposing series, we could say. Nature, whoa, he has much to say about nature to us. First of all, he says, all nature is simply the seer will the knowledge force of the conscious being 
at work to evolve in force and form all the inevitable truth of the idea into which it has originally thrown itself. That is from the life divine. And then in Essays Divine and Human, which we don't often read, but we should. For nature is nothing but the will of God in action. And in the synthesis, he says, nature, because she is a power of spirit, is essentially qualitative in her action. One may almost say that nature is only the power in being and the development in action of the infinite qualities of the spirit. And lastly, in essays on the Gita, very briefly, he says, nature is God's power of various self-becoming. So we have coercing the freedom of infinity with the stark array of nature's symbol facts and life's incessant signals of event. What does incessant mean? Oh, it means continuing without interruption. Transmuted chance recurrences into laws. To transmute is to change from one nature to another, or one substance, or one form, or one condition into another condition. To transform, to convert. Recurrence, of course, something that happens again. So, these chance recurrences, these things that reappear, and, and we, we call them chance, of course, we, because we're not fully aware yet of that there is no chance. Transmuted chance recurrences into laws, and then a chaos of signs into a universe. Oh. So the coercing of the freedom of infinity, these symbol facts of nature, and the incessant signals of event in life, and these chance recurrences that are transmuted into laws, out of this chaos of signs is created a universe. Full stop. Out of the rich wonders and the intricate whirls. Uh, the word whirl is important here because it's a, something that forms a coil or a spiral, curls or swirls. So these rich wonders and intricate whirls of what? of the spirit's dance with matter as its mask. How beautiful. The spirit's dance with matter as its mask. But what is matter? And Sri Aurobindo capitalizes it here. In the life divine, he says, matter is by no means fundamentally real. It is a structure of energy. Finally, science is in complete agreement with Sri Aurobindo. In the synthesis of yoga, he says, matter means the involution of the conscious delight of existence in self-oblivious force and in a self-dividing, infinitesimally disaggregated form. In his essays in philosophy and yoga, he says something else. Matter is only so much mobile energy vibrating 
intensely into form. Oh, that is so powerful. I'll repeat it again. Matter is only so much mobile energy vibrating intensely into form. And in essays, Divine and Human, he says matter is but a form of consciousness. And in the life divine, which is so important, matter, substance itself, subtle or dense, mental or material, is form and body of spirit. And he capitalizes the S in spirit. And would never have been created if it could not be made a basis for the self-expression of the spirit. And then in the synthesis of yoga, again, he says, in fact, matter itself is only an obscure form of the spirit. Now, I'd like to finish here with the life divine on matter. For there seems to be no reason why life should evolve out of material elements or mind out of living form, unless we accept the Vedantic solution that life is already involved in matter and mind in life. Because in essence, matter is a form of veiled life a form of veiled consciousness. I know this is very deep, but I hope that it will enter you in a different way, not at all through the mind, but directly into the soul. And in time, it will become even clearer because it has entered the soul and not merely the mind. So after he says all of this, that these incessant signals of event in life have transmuted chance recurrences into laws, a chaos of signs into a universe. And then he says, out of the rich wonders and the intricate worlds of the spirit's dance with matter as its mask, the balance of the world's design grew clear. Its symmetry of self-arranged effects. A symmetry, of course, is a similarity correspondence or a proportion among systems or parts of a system. So this symmetry of self-arranged, self-arranged here, hyphenated word, because hyphenated word makes it one word. It is self-arranged effects that are managed, the next line, managed in the deep perspectives of the soul. The definition of a perspective is uh, in the mental view, or, or it's a mental view or an outlook, outlet, outlook, sorry, in some aspects. But it's also the, the appearance of things that are relative to one another, as determined by their distance from the viewer. So the deep perspectives of the soul. And the next line, and the realism of its elusive art. Elusive here is, is not something based on illusion so much as deceptive or unreal. So this balance of the world's design growing clear 
and of course matter is always capitalized here, its symmetry of self-arranged effects that are managed in the deep perspectives of the soul and the realism. See, realism of its elusive art. It's not an unreal art. It's, it's sort of deceptive. The realism of its elusive art, its logic of infinite intelligence, its magic of a changing eternity. Uh, how could we say that eternity changes? Eternity is eternity. But Mother says there is always evolution going on, and there will always be evolution. In fact, she says that the super, supermental is not the end of evolution at all. Once we rise above the supermental, we will begin to explore all the realms of Satchit Ananda. Then he says, a glimpse was caught of things forever unknown. Now, this is the yoga of the soul's release. So, Ashwapati has not seen all of this as yet, but he catches a glimpse of it, of these things that are forever unknown. And he sees the next line, the letters stood out of the unmoving word. Now here I ask you to bear with me again because in the future poetry, Sri Aurobindo speaks so beautifully about the word. And he says, the word is a sound expression of the idea. In the supraphysical plane, when an idea has to be realized, one can, by repeating the word expression of it, produce vibrations which prepare the mind for the realization of the idea. That is the principle of the mantras and of japa. One repeats the name of the divine, and the vibrations created in the consciousness prepare the realization of the divine. It is the same idea that is expressed in the Bible. God said, let there be light, and there was light. It is creation by the word. This is so powerful to me, so beautiful. Creation by the word. And then in the life divine, he says, the silent and the active Brahman are not different, opposite and irreconcilable entities. The one denying the other, affirming a cosmic illusion. They are one Brahman in two aspects, positive and negative, and each is necessary to the other. It is out of this silence that the word, again, capitalized W, which creates the worlds forever proceeds, for the word expresses that which is self-hidden in the silence. in the immutable, nameless origin. What is immutable here? Well, the simplest explanation, definition of it, is something that is not subject to change or even susceptible to change. And the origin, again, Sri Aurobindo capitalizes the O of origin. The origin is the point at which something comes into existence. 
or from which it derives or is derived. It is also the first stage of existence, the beginning. In, there's a colon after the word, the letters stood out of the unmoving word. So we now still have in the immutable, nameless origin was seen emerging as from fathomless seas, the trail of ideas that made the world. Fathomless is something impossible to measure the depth of, something even impossible to understand, incomprehensible, even bottomless. The trail of the ideas that made the world. Now Sri Aurobindo capitalizes the word ideas, and he has so much to say about them. Um, would you like me to continue? Or is sure. 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 Yes, please. Okay. Yes. Because this this is so important. He says he says the idea is the realization of a truth in consciousness, as the fact is its realization in power. That's from the supermental manifestation. And again, from the same small book, The Supermental Manifestation, he says, the idea is not a reflection of the external fact, which it so much exceeds. Rather, the fact is only a partial reflection of the idea which has created it. And then he gives us a word in the life divine, and he uses the word quite often. And I will read what he says. The view I am presenting goes farther in idealism. It sees the creative idea, capital I, as real idea, capital R, capital I, that is to say, a power of conscious force, expressive of real being, born out of real being, and partaking of its nature, and neither a child of the void, nor a weaver of fictions. It is conscious reality, throwing itself into mutable forms, of its own imperishable and immutable substance. The world is therefore not a figment of conception in the universal mind, but a conscious birth of that which is beyond mind into forms of itself. This we have to remember that and, and I'll re read that last sentence again. It's so important. The world is therefore not a figment of conception in the universal mind, and he capitalizes mind twice here, but a conscious birth of that which is beyond mind into forms of itself. And then he speaks of the supermind. In supermind, being Consciousness of knowledge and consciousness of will are not divided as they seem to be in our mental operations. They are a trinity, one movement with three effective aspects. Each has its own effect. Being gives the effect of substance, consciousness the effect of knowledge, of the self-guiding and shaping idea of comprehension and apprehension. Will gives the effect of self-fulfilling force. But the idea 
is only the light of the reality illumining itself. It is not mental thought, nor imagination, but effective self-awareness. It is real idea, capitalized and hyphenated. So these, this trail of the ideas that made the world and sown in the black earth of nature's trance. Interesting. Sri tells us that nature's trance is in a black earth. Earth is usually referred to as being brown, often a rich brown, but nature, Again, a capital N. Trance is in an earth that is black, obscure. And sown in the black earth of nature's trance, the seed of the spirit's blind and huge desire. In the letters on yoga, and this last line, the word spirit is capitalized. In these letters, he says, the spirit is the consciousness above mind, the Atman or self, which is always in oneness with the divine. And I'd like to go a little further in quote from essays on the Gita, briefly. What we mean by spirit is self-existent being with an infinite power of consciousness and unconditioned delight in its being. And then the life divine. There are so many different things, essays on the Gita, synthesis of yoga, the human cycle, the life divine, all of these things in which he speaks of spirit. So in the letters on yoga, he says, the spirit is an essential entity or consciousness, which does not need to think or perceive, either in the mental or the sensory way, because whatever knowledge it has is direct or essential knowledge. And then in the life divine, he says, spirit is the soul and reality of that which we sense as matter. Matter is a form and body of that which we realize as spirit. Oh. And I can't go through all of them, but lastly, in the human cycle, the nature of the spirit is a spacious inner freedom and a large unity into which each man must be allowed to grow according to his own nature. And I will close with essays in philosophy and yoga. The spirit is the truth of our being, mind and life and body in their imperfection are its masks but in their perfection should be its molds the secret of the spirit's blind and huge desire from which the tree of cosmos was conceived now, the tree of cosmos is a very common metaphor in many spiritual traditions. Uh, it is the tree with its roots above in the heavens. 
and its branches spread downward and spread its magic arms through a dream of space. These mystical lines so filled with beauty speak of the tree of cosmos being conceived from the seed of the spirit's huge blind desire. And here desire is not the term we traditionally understand but the tremendous aspiration of the spirit seed, which is blind, that is unseeing, but again, not blind as we know it. Uh, I'll end today's talk with a, with a personal uh, experience. When I had this dream that was sent to mother and she said it was uh, sorry, it was Annie's dream of me, which was sent to mother. And I was climbing up the walls of St. Paul's School. And it, it, it appeared to those down from the, way below down that uh, it was extremely dangerous. But I saw a golden tree in the sky and i said i must bring this branch down to the earth for the mother it was pure gold and i did and one day i was recalling this experience and our vladimir said a tree of heaven transplant to mortal soul that is in Savitri. Namaste all and thank you for attending. We'll be again together next week. I hope this was not daunting today, but it is the words of Sri Aurobindo. And that is more important to me than anything else. Namaste. Namaste. Thank you. Thank you. Namaste, Naoji. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you so much, Naoji. Thank you so much. Thank you so much, Naoji. You're welcome. If you have any questions, you can yeah, ask thank you. You can always write them to me. Uh, thank you so much, Naoji. You're welcome. Narada12 at gmail.com. Very simple. Narada. 12 at gmail.com. I have one question, Naraji, if you have a few minutes to spare. We can always have a few minutes to spare. Okay. Thank you. So this is with regards to um, the, the two things that jumps out. One is the spirit dance with matter. And as soon as you mentioned it, it almost felt like I actually had the vision of Shiva's dance. Has it got to do anything with that at all? Is there an, uh, can we draw a parallel to Shiva's dance? Yes, because he, he does dance on the, on the divine creatrix's breast. And that, that is uh, how matter begins, is it not? Got it. I just wanted to make sure it wasn't my imagination. No, <laughs> it's, it's, a good, it, it's a good, very good. Okay. The, the other one is with regards to the sown in the black earth of nature's trance. Yes. Is the black earth the inconscient that we are talking about? Of course. Absolutely. Okay. Yes. It's, okay. it's, you know, nature's in a trance here in the beginning. And, and he is, uh, Ashwapati is just seeing this initially e eventually of course the earth changes because well it's it's an inconscient divine creation at first that becomes through evolution more and more conscious and then with the advent of the divine mother everything changes and the earth uh, Earth is this 
there, there are so many so many quotes I could share, but it's a little late. But on the earth and and what the earth means to us, and and when we read Book Eleven, uh, which has about one thousand lines and only one canto, we will see how beautiful this earth truly is and is becoming more and more. Namaste. Namaste. Thank you so much.